Good morning this morning. I hope that you are uh, doing well. Uh, this morning we're going to be celebrating uh, Mother's Day, and so I want to start off by saying thank you to my own mother. Uh, I am uh, eternally grateful for all that she has meant to me in my life and her continued influence in my life. She's one of the smartest, kindest uh, women that I've ever met, and so thank you, Mom, for being all that you uh, all that you are and being all that God has created you to be. So this morning we're going to be celebrating mothers uh, specifically, but in some ways we're going to be celebrating womanhood or womanhood uh, more in general. So uh, now it is uh, certainly certain that not every woman is a mother. Uh, we have ladies in our church who are uh, not uh, mothers in the technical sense. Of the term, and so we're going to look at it sort of in a broader category than looking specifically just at at only just mothers in the technical sense of the term. So within our church, we have this right. We have uh, mothers or women who are not who are not mothers in the technical sense, but we also have mothers whose children have uh, left the nest already. So maybe they feel like, in some way, their role as a mother has been. Uh, diminished or probably maybe more like not quite as urgent as it used to be. Uh, some may even begin to feel like they have lost some sort of identity as their children have grown up and left and left home or perhaps maybe their children are starting families of their own. But it's my hope that as we study the scriptures this morning that we will see together that the church very much still needs motherly figures in the church, whether that's in the technical sense or just in the sense of their of their person. They are a motherly poor person in the church. And this is true whether you have children of your own or whether you don't have children of your own. The church needs godly women to be motherly in order for the church to function properly, which is what we'll see today. Now, all throughout our church and churches everywhere, younger women are constantly being bombarded with what the culture is telling them, what they that they must, uh, what the culture is telling them they must look like, or that they must act like, or what they must be, or what they must do with their lives. So we're going to be speaking not only to uh, older godly women, but we're also going to be talking to younger godly women as we see these traits that should, should be emulated. But godly women, they have to be the voice of reason. And the voice of godliness in the lives of the younger women as they are seeking to follow after Christ in all of their lives. So we're going to read this passage together. We'll be in Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. We'll be looking specifically at verses 3 through 5, but I'm going to read 1 through 5. So Ch Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And we're going to start with a few premises before we begin to walk through our passage uh, to, be in, to begin to expose it. So let's read this and then we will pray and ask God's blessing upon his word. Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. But as for you, and this is, he's saying this to Titus, as for you, as opposed to these false teachers, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith and love and in steadfastness. And here's what we'll pick up this morning. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and their children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. So let's pray and ask God's blessing upon his word. Our Father in heaven, we come to you this morning, and Lord, we are thankful for mothers everywhere. God, we know that you created womanhood, that you created motherhood. And Father, we know that uh, you have a special plan for, uh, for this office or this role to be carried out within the church. And Father, this morning we pray that we wouldn't be distracted by all of the things that are going on around us. We pray that you would center us here, that you would center us in your word, and that you would focus us through your spirit as your people to be able to understand your word in a a clear way, in a way that would immediately apply to our lives. And Father, this morning we pray that we wouldn't allow the culture to dictate uh, what we as Christians believe or how we as Christians act. Father, we pray that as your people that we would stand firmly upon the foundation of your unchanging word. God, this morning it's my aim to be clear and understandable. And even though I'm going to be talking specifically in many ways to to older women or younger women, Father, I pray that we as 
The men of the church would emulate these exact characteristics as well. Father, I pray that ultimately we would show your love and that we would reveal Christ, that we would exemplify Christ in all that we do. Father, I pray that you would be pleased with what we do here this morning. Father, empower us through your spirit. God, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so before we start to walk through this passage talking about it, I wanted to offer up a few biblical premises that are going to serve as the foundation of what we're going to be studying today. The premise, the first premise, premise one, is that God created womanhood. So the first foundational truth is that God created womanhood. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see that what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And then the man said, This is last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. So we see that God created womanhood. God created women. In the beginning, he saw that it was not good for man to be alone. So he created a woman to be a helpmate or a, a helper fit for the man. So God created women. The second premise is, is that God created both men and women in his image. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And I don't have to remind you that that means that there are in fact two separate genders. Male and female both created by God to image God to the creation, which leads to premise number three. God wanted to image himself through his creation of womanhood in a way that is good and in a way that would not be accomplished completely if women were not around, if women were men, if everybody was a man. Let me say that again. God wanted to image himself through his creation of womanhood in a way that is good and would not be accomplished completely if women were Men. God did not create women by accident. It was not some uh, leftover thought. It was not uh, to curtail some, some accident that he created uh, in the cosmos. God created all things good. God is omniscient. He is omnipotent. God knows the beginning from the end. God knows all things at all times. God created man and woman to image him, image him to the creation, to be in his image. Premise number four. God designed men and women to be equal in worth and value, but with differing roles that complement one another. Let me say that again. God designed men and women to be equal in worth and value, but with differing roles that complement one another. So I want to be clear from the outset. We're not going to spend too much time on it today, but all of the passages that talk about differing roles for men and women doesn't mean that women are in any way uh, less loved by God, any less valued by God. God created men and women in His image to image Him to the creation. He created them both for a purpose and He created them with equal value, but He created them with different roles in mind, roles that would complement one another. Eve was created to complement Adam. Adam was created to do certain things and Eve was created to do certain things, but they both image God. They both glorify God in the things that they do. Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 through 28. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. That means that as far as worth and value and dignity, men and women are equal. The only difference is their role. So with those 
four premises in mind, that God created womanhood, that God created men and women in His image, that God wanted to image Himself through His creation of womanhood in a way that is good and would not be accomplished completely if women were men. And then the fourth premise, God designed men and women to be equal in worth and value, but with differing roles that complement one another. And this is all according to His plan. Now, with those underlying assumptions on the table, let's look at what the Bible says in our passage. The first thing that I want us to see is that godly, and I'm not going to call them older, godly motherly women are expected to live a life of faithful holiness. It's the first thing that I want us to see. Godly motherly women are expected to live a life of faithful holiness. Look what it says in verse 3. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. Okay? So we see this. So we see that the first thing that he says is that older women are to be reverent in behavior. Now, Paul uses a unique word here. It would literally be like temple worthiness. It's this idea of like a priestess. If you wanted to sum it up, it would be that they are meant to be godly. Motherly women in the church, and I, when I say motherly women, I don't mean women that just have kids. I mean women who are, who are motherly figures in the church that are watching after the children and watching out for the younger women as well. Motherly women in the church are expected to be godly. They are expected to be godly the same way that men are expected to be godly. In verse 2, older men are to be self-controlled dignified, sound in faith, and love and steadfastness. So older men and older women are expected to be godly in the church. They are expected to live godly lives. This means that older women and younger women, remember, younger women are seeking to emulate this, they are to be modest. I mean, that should go without saying. Like, right? motherly figures in the church, they are to be Modest in the way that they dress, they are to be modest in the way that they, the way that they act. They are to exemplify Christ. They are to let their adornment be from the inside. They are to let their beauty come from the inside out. Now, it doesn't mean that they're not beautiful. It just means that they are carrying themselves in a modest way, a way that is pleasing to their Lord, a way that would. Be exemplary of who they are in Christ. It shows that their dignity and their worth comes from who they are in Christ, not what they look like on the outside, which is true for every woman, regardless of age. Like your worth and your value comes from who you are in Christ, not from what you look like. So uh, an older lady, in order to be reverent in behavior, must be modest. The second thing I would say about this reverent in behavior is they need to be sound in their wisdom. They need to be sound in their wisdom. They don't need to make snap decisions. They don't need to make fly-off-the-handle style decisions or judgments. They need to be sound in their wisdom. Just as older men, as we can look to older men in the church to be wise in the way that they deal with situations and wise in the way that they carry out the commands of the Lord. We should expect the same thing from older motherly women in the church. They need to be sound in their wisdom. When we look at them, we should know that they are going to be wiser. They're going to make better decisions than those who are in their 20s or maybe even in their 30s. These are women who you can go to and they will always portray this certain amount of of wisdom that comes from walking with the Lord Jesus Christ in every aspect of their life. But they're also to be dignified. If you want to be reverent, if you want to be like a, 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 a temple-worthy person, a, a priestess-type person, if you will, you need to be dignified in the way that you carry yourself. And you think about it, as somebody who is reverent, a person that is reverent, that means they... They, are, they hold things in reverence, like we, we look at them and we think that they are a pious person. They are holy in the way that they live. They're not people who, who carry themselves in a way that is undignified. When you think about the women that have most impacted your life, those motherly type figures, maybe it's your mother or your grandmother, or maybe it's some other person, maybe it's an aunt or a distant relative, or perhaps it's just somebody in the church, a Sunday school teacher or a, a teacher at the school. Most of the time, these people all have one thing in common. They carry themselves in a very dignified way. 
person who is always flying off the handle, a person who doesn't carry themselves with class or dignity, is not a person that can be trusted or, or looked upon to make wise decisions. Which leads to the last thing. I would say that if you're going to be reverent in behavior, then you have to be more mature than those who are younger than them. You have to be more mature than those who are younger than them. Now this is touching on a, a, a sensitive point, I would say. Uh, this is meaning that you don't need to be 20. You don't need to look like you're 20. You don't need to act like you're 20. In fact, if you are acting that way, then you are doing a great disservice to the body of Christ. You are doing a great disservice to who you are as a person. You need to be more mature acting than those who are younger than you. If you want to be somebody in, in other people's lives who they can look up to, whether you are a man or a woman, but specifically talking this morning about godly women, if you want to be a godly woman in the church that younger women can look to, to emulate, can say, hey, I want to follow her as she follows after Christ. Well, then you need to be more mature than those who are younger than you in the faith. The second thing that Paul says is they're not to be slanderers. Reverent in behavior, not slanderers. And some people would take this and they would simply say, well, this isn't that big of a deal. You know, I mean, it is what it is. It's, it's beauty shop talk or people do it all the time. But I want you to understand the gravity of what Paul's saying here. In the Greek, this term that he's using, using is the word diabolos. It is a word, or diabolos. It is the word that we get devil from. Devil literally means slanderer. And so this is not something that can be simply swept under the rug. So this type of person who is not a slanderer, this, this godly, motherly Christian lady is not a slanderer. This is the type of woman who does not associate with lies or falsehoods. She also doesn't spread gossip or smear others' reputation so that way she can look better. And in the olden days, you know, we make jokes about it being this is barber shop talk or this is beauty shop talk. But the fact of the matter is we have to be even more careful as the body of Christ today due to the, uh, through the advent of, of social media and the, the perceived anonymity that comes with typing on a keyboard behind a screen or, or typing into your, your phone as you're waiting in line. We have to be very careful about the type of information, about the type of things that we are putting out there for people to read. And surely with our mouths, we are to glorify God. We're not to run everybody else into the ground. We're not to be slanderers. We're not to be the type of person that associates with lies or, or falsehoods like a good, godly, motherly lady. She's above all of that. Like she is above all of that nonsense and that garbage, that drama that carries on with so much of life. She is above all of that. Whenever you look to her, whenever you look at her, you can say that is the type of person that I could spill my heart out to and the only person she's going to take that to is the Lord as she intercedes for me in prayer. God, raise up a generation of godly, motherly women who are not slanderers. And then he says they can't be slaves to much wine. And this must have been an issue that happened in Crete, specifically where Titus is, because he has to mention this with the qualifications of, of the elders as well. Can't be a person that is, is, is given too much, too much wine. But the fact of the matter is, is that godly, motherly Christian ladies in the church can't be drunks. Let me just say that again. Godly motherly Christian women in the church, they just simply cannot be drunks. They cannot be people who are constantly getting drunk or wine bippers that are drinking all of the time. Now, I will grant that this passage doesn't in any way teach that you have to be a complete teetotaler, that you can't have anything to drink. That's not what it what it teaches, but it does teach that it is someone who is not a drunkard, who is not enslaved by wine, a person who is not given too much wine. But I would say that it is wise, I would make the argument that it is wise to abstain totally, both for your sake and for the sake of those around you. I would just remind you of a couple of things. What you do in moderation, your children tend to do in excess. Let me say that again. What you do in moderation, 
your children tend to do in excess. Think about the way that, that the, the thinking goes. Well, I know that it's probably not okay, but my mom and my dad do it. And look at them, they're fine. I mean, I turned out okay and they were my parents. Be careful. What you tend to do in moderation, your children will tend to do in excess. The second reason is that we should not drink alcohol is because it causes others to stumble. If you are known to be a Christian person in the, in the church, in the community, and you are constantly drinking, it causes people to stumble. It causes people to, to look at you and think that that's what Christ would look like, and that is not the case. And it would cause younger people in the faith, people who do not have uh, the freedom of conscience to be able to partake, it would also cause them to stumble. And so because we love our neighbor and we love our brothers and sisters in Christ, it's probably better to abstain completely. And the third reason is for you. I've been around for a little while. I'm not, I'm not in any way uh, an older person. And people may look at me and say, you're still a young buck. Well, I understand that totally. But I've been around the block just a little. And I can tell you that most often people don't have the ability to stop. I mean, if we're just going to be perfectly honest, I'm going to be honest with you. You probably don't have the ability simply to stop. Don't overestimate your own willpower when it comes to drinking. Like very often, I would say most often, people are going to have more than they should. And they're going to step over that, that drinking in moderation. They're going to step directly into that period of do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. They are going to sin because most, more often than not, they're not going to have the willpower to be able to stop. So don't overestimate your willpower. So I would argue that it is best for Christians not to drink alcohol. Now, I want to say, as we look at these characteristics, as we finish them out, this list is surely not exhaustive, and it is in no way only for older ladies. But there is a certain emphasis that is placed, uh, placed here upon those who are older women. And there is there is something that is uniquely holy and Christ-like when someone is around an older person who has walked with Jesus and personifies these traits in their life. And I think it's probably because in many ways they are just imaging the traits of the Lord to those around them. I mean, you think about it. Some of the people who have impacted me the most are people who are, who are limited in what they can do physically. It is people who, who are older, who have walked with Jesus for a long time. There is, there is something that is uniquely holy and something that is uniquely Christ-like whenever you meet a lady who is reverent in behavior, who is not a slanderer, and who is not a drunkard. There is something that is uniquely holy whenever you meet an older man who is sober-minded and dignified and self-controlled and sound in faith. There is something good about it. And it's because God has created it to be this way, which is what we'll see next. But if I were to sum this point up, I would say that Christian women are called to live a life above reproach, a life of holiness and dignity. And rather than trying to always seem young or in touch with the end things of the culture, motherly Christian ladies should portray a wisdom that can only come from one who has walked with Jesus through valleys and on mountaintops. Like older or godly motherly Christian ladies in the church they should not be trying to be 20 they shouldn't be trying to be in with what's in in the culture you know what they need to do they need to wear their age like a crown that wisdom that they have gained that faith that they have that is unshakable that faith in Christ that only comes as you have lived a life of 50 or 60 or 70 years Leaning on the Lord and finding Him faithful. Walking through the, on the mountaintops and walking through the valleys. We need godly women who live this way. But the second thing is, godly motherly women are expected not only to live a life of holiness, but to teach and train younger women in what is good. Godly motherly women are expected to teach and train younger women in what is good. Read verses 4-5. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands. Look at this, that the word of God may not be reviled. So the older women are called to train and teach younger women, but at the same time, younger women are to make their aim 
So the older women, to be godly, so the older women are training and teaching younger women, but younger women are making it their pursuit and their aim to emulate the older women. They are trying their best to live a godly, a godly life that would be pleasing to God. Like, as someone who has been redeemed, like, we enjoy God through obedience to His Word. And that's what a young lady should be doing, even at the same time as an older lady is pouring into her life. Now, I want to notice these things. These things that Paul lists here are things that, as a pastor, I can surely speak into from God's Word. I can tell you what God's Word means about each one of these things, which we will look at them. But think about it. Only godly women in the church can speak to these things experientially. Now you say, Pastor, what do you mean? Well, I can read and I can tell you what the Bible says about godly young women or godly older women, just like we're doing here today. But only a woman who has walked with Jesus can tell a younger lady how to do these things from her own experience walking with Christ. So Paul tells them to, to teach them. That's what he says. They are to teach what is good. Not slaves to much wine, but to teach. They are to teach what is good. This is a necessity. Let me say that again. This is not a, a nicety. This is not something that is on the periphery of God's plan for the church. As I said, God designed it this way. This is a necessity in the church. Now, women are not called to be passive when it comes to training younger women in the faith. They are called to be actively teaching the younger ladies. I mean, think about it this way. Who else in the church can a young Christian woman go to in order to find practical wisdom in living out the life of a godly woman except for a godly woman that is in the church with her? I mean, all throughout the church. Think about this. All throughout the church. Even in a church that is the size of First Baptist Spurter, we have... We have ladies who are at various levels of experience in all different facets of life. Like we have ladies who are who who are who have experienced being a young lady. So we have we have ladies who know what it's like to be a young lady, like struggling with what it's like to be a, a person that is a lady walking through elementary school, right? Who is living through her teenage I mean her junior high years as she knows the pressures of these things. Like a godly woman who has lived these things. She knows what that feels like experientially whenever you are, you are trying to figure out who you are as a person. As you are walking through these younger years, these formative years of life. And to be perfectly honest, church, like the mothers in the home should be doing this, should be modeling this and talking to the young ladies about it. But because of the fallenness and the sinfulness of the world that we live in, even in the, the, the small town that we live in here, Listen to me, sisters. There are young, elementary age, junior high, junior high age little girls, many of whom have professed Christ, who are your sisters in Christ, who when they go home, they don't see a godly lady. And so like, we need godly women of all ages teaching these young ladies how to be a young godly lady in elementary and junior high but i mean think about it. what i mean what happens whenever a young lady crosses the threshold from like 12 13 into her teenage years like those years are are, are like the jungle of, for a lady you think about all of the experiences that a young lady experiences as she's going through her teenage years and like i have never lived as a young teenage girl. I mean, praise God, I have never lived as a young teenage girl. We need older women to be pouring into these young teenage women. Like there are, there are all kinds of things in the culture that are doing their best to pull these ladies, these young ladies, these teenage girls in directions that God would never have them to go in ways that would frighten us or would break our hearts, specifically me as a father of two young ladies. Like it breaks my heart to see the direction that the culture is trying to pull these young teenage girls in. And we need godly women in the church to stand in the gap and say, not that way. Do not go that way, young lady. Think about whenever a young college girl is leaving home for the first time. Like, I mean, you think about how a, a young college girl is 
leaving the nest. Maybe she's been raised in a, in a Christian, a godly Christian home, but now she's leaving the security of that godly Christian home and she's going to live on a college campus somewhere by herself. Like We need godly, motherly ladies in the church to pour into the lives of college-age girls. Think about being a wife. I mean, I know that my wife would say that her marriage has just been total bliss and that that it has been nothing but heaven on the earth, which of course I'm exaggerating and I'm joking. But think about it. All throughout our church, there are young ladies who are entering into the covenant of marriage. And like marriage is tough. It's, it's hard. I mean, you have, you have two totally different people who are, who are coming together and they both have their sinful tendencies and their sinful problems and they are coming together. And those first few years are tough. And you know what a young bride needs more than anything? She needs an older lady to come to her and to say, you know what? Stick with it. Stick with it. Stay with it. Like the first few years are difficult, but hey, you're going to get your feet underneath you and this thing is going to be glorious and it is going to be God edifying. It's going to be God exemplifying to the world. It's going to be edifying for your soul. Like think about being a wife or being a mother. I mean, all different aspects of being a mother that I have nothing, that I have no, no idea about experientially. I mean, think it being a mother of a baby of a little baby in those, those times of life whenever you're not getting any sleep at home and the young mother is doing all that she can to even be able to put her shirt on the right way, right? This is this picture of a, of a, of a young mother and she has this little bitty baby and she's operating on like one or two hours of sleep and like sometimes she feels like all oh, hope is lost and what she needs is a, another mother who has lived through the states to come along and say, hey, it's not going to be like this forever. Or what about toddlers? I mean, once the baby starts moving around, like I remember whenever my children were coming from being a baby to a toddler, I think, hey, if they could just get out of this baby stage and start walking around, that's gonna be that's gonna be great. But what I found is that just means you gotta chase them all over the house. That is a scary thing. So what about mothers of toddlers? Like I have no idea as a pastor what it's like to be a mom of a toddler. But many of you do. And you can pour into those young mothers. Or then teenagers. Like I shudder to even say that. My, my daughter, my oldest daughter is 12. I mean, you think about what it's like, what, what you went through as the mother of a teenager, things that me and my wife are yet to experience, but things that many of you as godly, motherly women in the church have, have already experienced. You know what to do. You know what not to do, right? You know the pitfalls of having a teenager. You know how to navigate the waters, as it were. And like we as a church, we need godly women to be doing this exact thing from experience. Or what of adult children? I, have being a mother of an adult child. I mean, whether that adult child is good or bad, like those are things that you can speak into. Or the same goes with being a, a grandmother. Like the joy of, of experiencing what it's like to have your first grandchild as you are now a, a proud grandma of, of, your, of your son or your daughter's uh, young baby. You know, but there's another category. You know, it, motherhood is not, or marriage is not, the only plan that God has for women in the church. Like, Paul makes it abundantly clear that some women and men, some people are called to singleness. And God gives them a gift of singleness so that they can devote themselves to the Lord. Listen, some of the most, most uh, widely and proudly used people of God have been single have been single people. So there are single women in the church, single older ladies in the church who can pour into that young single person and can show them how to navigate this life on their own. And you know what all of these things have in common? I as a man have absolutely no idea what any of these experiences feel like or what it's like to live through them. But you do. And that's why Paul says they are to teach what is good and so train the young women. That's exactly why God prescribed this in the book of Titus, right here in chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, that older women, that godly, motherly Christian women in the church are to teach and train the younger women. Because I have no idea what those experiences were like, but many of you do. So then Paul says, 
that they are to train them in specific avenues or specific areas. And this is not exhaustive. It's just sort of a list of things that Paul says they should train them in. To love their husbands. Now this goes beyond mere emotion. You know that. This carries with it the idea of how to choose to love their husband well. You know, it's a fact, it's a matter of fact that love is not just an emotion. It's a choice that we make. It is something that God commands us to do. And only a godly older woman can teach or train a younger lady how to love her husband well. And this doesn't just mean with words either. We also see this. We see this exemplified in those marriages that have been going on for for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And those are pictures of God's grace that an older woman can pour into the life of a young married lady. The second thing is to love their children. I mean, this is what he says, to love their husbands and to love their children. Now, emotionally, to be sure, most of the time, this comes without much prompting. A woman is going to love her children unless there's something seriously wrong. But think about this. Loving children doesn't just mean that you are, are hugging them and that you are emotionally attached to them. Loving children also comes with the idea of disciplining children, disciplining them, to leading them uh, in the way of the Lord, to training them for righteousness, right? It also comes with this idea of training them how to be godly young people. So it comes with the idea of both discipline and training. And these are areas that can get rather tricky. tricky. How do you... How do you discipline well? How do you love your kids through discipline? How do you love your kids by training them to be godly? But then he also says that they are to be trained, they are to train them to be self-controlled. This means not indulging in every temptation that comes their way. Like you need to be able to train them and to show them that God's way is the best way. And that the lie that the culture gives them is harmful for them. The lie that they can do whatever they want simply because they want to do it. That, that lie is harmful and devastating for a young person. Like we, we need to be telling everyone that. But godly, motherly women need to be telling younger women this specifically. And by the way, younger women are to be living this life. As older women, remember as I said, as older women are teaching, younger women are living this way. Fourth thing is to be pure. To be self-controlled, to be able to say no to the temptations that come their way, to be pure. Now, I take this to mean to be chaste, to be uh, celibate until marriage, but also it means to be a one, a one man woman, right? I'm used to saying a one woman man and looking at the qualifications for either a deacon or an elder. But the fact of the matter is a wife is to only have eyes for her husband. She's only to be uh, attached in an emotional and in an intimate way, physically and emotionally, to only her husband. And this is something that a, a godly, motherly, older woman needs to tell a younger lady. And also, he says, not only pure, but working at home. Now, this doesn't mean that a woman only can work from home. It doesn't mean that she has to work exclusive, exclusively from home. Literally, what Paul says is that she needs to be busy at home. And the idea is managing the affairs of the home. So while it doesn't mean that a woman has to work from home, that she can't have a job anywhere. That's not what it means. It is a reminder that a Christian woman's first priority is her marriage and her children, not her career. Let me say that again. God's Word makes it abundantly clear that while a woman can work, work outside of the home, she can, she can make money, she can do these things. A Christian woman's first priority is her marriage. She is to love her husband well and her children. She is to train them up in the way they should go, not her career. So if working for you outside of the home means that you neglect regularly your husband and your children, then in fact you are sinning against God. So uh, you have to use discernment here. Paul is saying that your first priority is your children and your husband. And then he goes on to say to be kind. This means that you uh, treat others the way that Christ would treat them. And to be honest, sometimes that is difficult, isn't it? The last thing that he says here is to be submissive to their own husbands. Now, I put a heavy emphasis on this. To be submissive to their own husband. Look what he says there. To be submissive to their own husband. I know some of the translations leave that out because they believe that it would be superfluous to put that in there. But that's literally in there. To be uh, submitted or to submit themselves to be submissive to their own husband. This doesn't mean that a woman... Uh, is submissive to everybody else's husband. That's not what it means. It means that in the, in the God-given role that she has, she is submissive to her own husband. Paul gives an extensive treatment of this in Ephesians chapter 5. 
This also doesn't mean that a woman is a doormat for her husband. The Bible never, ever, ever commands a man to be a dictator in his home. In fact, it commands the husband to love his wife as Christ loved the church, who gave his life for her. So a man is called to love his wife like Christ loves the church, while the woman is called to submit to her husband. So while it doesn't mean that she's called to be a doormat, and it doesn't mean that she is called to be submissive to everyone's husband, only her own, it does mean that she needs to seek to live out the marriage prescribed by God and demonstrated in the son's submission to the father and the church's submission to the son. That's two examples that you can look to of what this means. And to be perfectly honest, this is not something that a young lady is going to get from the culture. This is only something the young lady is going to get from the church. So in this area specifically, we need godly, motherly women in the church to step up and to train young ladies in this regard. And what's the result of this? Well, the result of this, he says, is that the word of God might not be, may not be revealed. This is, the ex this is the result of this. So it will exemplify the type of life that is God honoring. And listen, this type of life leads to the joy and the peace that only comes through obedience to God and his word. So it's paradoxical here. We think of, of rules being applied to take away our freedom. But what I'm telling you, Christian young lady, Christian older lady, is that by living the life that God has called you to live, that is how you will find your joy and your freedom. Because God knows what is best for His kingdom. So by living these realities out, not only will you exemplify the type of life that is God-honoring, but you will also enjoy the joy and the peace that comes through obedience to God and His Word. So what do I say? So, so to summarize this, what would I say? I would say this, the church desperately, desperately, desperately needs godly, motherly women to take charge in raising up the next generation of godly, motherly women. How? By living as an example and teaching them God's word. And at the same time, the church needs godly young ladies who are seeking to live the life that God prescribes them in his word seeking to magnify Christ in all that they do. But there's one other thing that I want to show you here, and that's this, that our Christian life, this is both for men and women, is only possible because of God's grace. Let me say that again. Our Christian life for both men and women is only possible because of God's grace in our lives. These are not things that we that we do within ourselves. Look at chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. We'll, look, we'll walk through it very quickly. For by the grace of God, or for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us, you see that? Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, there's that word again, upright and godly lives in the present age. So right now, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So I would say four things out of this. The first thing is that Christ gave his life for us to, so that we could be reconciled to God. So Christ gave his life for us to reconcile us to God. Look what he says in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. So Christ gave his life for us so that we could be reconciled to God. That's, that's how we are in this Christian life to begin with. But look what he says in the next verse. Training us to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. So Christ gave him his life, Christ gave himself for us to reconcile us to God, but he also gave himself for us to redeem us from sin and to free us up to live a life of godliness right now. For God's grace has appeared, bringing salvation, training us to renounce ungodliness, worldly passion. So Christ gave us, gave himself for us so that we could be freed from our sins, so that we could live a godly life now. But Christ also gave himself for us to give us an eternal hope of glory. Look at verse 13. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
This means that whatever we endure in this life, whatever we go through, whatever hardships that motherhood or fatherhood or, or being a woman or a man bring, whatever the case may be, our blessed hope is not in this life, that we are eternally minded, that we can live the commands of God because we have been freed from our sin and because we are looking to the day when we will spend eternity with Christ in glory. But the last thing that he says is that he gave himself for us to adopt us into his eternal kingdom that is characterized by joy and holiness forevermore. Look what he says, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, to purify for himself a people for his own possession. I love that we belong to Christ who are zealous, zealous for good works. Like it is the theological truths of 11 through 14 that enable us to live the practical life that God has called us to live in Christ Jesus. So I don't know where you are today, but if you are a Christian woman, I pray that you will think through these things. I pray that if you're a, a motherly Christian lady in the church, if you are an older lady in the church, I pray that you will take an active role in training and teaching the younger women to live godly lives. If you are a younger lady in the church, I pray that you will seek to live a godly life and that you will seek out godly women to be role models and mentors in your life as you seek to do all things according to the, to the word of God and for the glory of God. Listen, if you're not a Christian here today, then what you need is you need to be saved. You don't need to try to do these things so that way you can earn favor with God. That will never, that will never work. You need God's grace. And this is exactly what he says at the end of this. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. The Bible says that we are separated from a holy God. And that if we were to die in this separation, then we would spend all of eternity punished, punished in hell for our sins by God. So we are separated from God because of our sins. But God in His grace did not leave us in the state of separation. He sent His Son, Jesus, who came willingly, who came to this earth and lived a perfectly sinless life and then died on a cross to pay for our sins, to pay for your sins. Then He was buried in a tomb. But then He was raised from the dead by the power of God and He ascended to be with the Father. And the Bible says that anyone who turns away from their sin and self and to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation will be saved. So if that's you today... I would urge you, whether you are a man or a woman or a child, if you are hearing this, I would urge you to repent of your sins and believe the gospel, to turn to Jesus, acknowledge that you are a sinner, ask Him to save you, and commit yourself to Him as your Lord. And the Bible says that He will save you. Wherever you are this morning, let's go to the Lord and let's close our service with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for today. God, we're thankful for your word. God, we're thankful for all that you do in and through us. And God, we are thankful this morning for godly women in our church. God, I am thankful for godly young women in our church. And Father, for that matter, matter I'm thankful for this church. God, I'm thankful for all of the, the leaders and the children and all of the people that you have placed in this church. And God, I pray for the women of our church. Father, as the culture constantly attacks them in this never ceasing onslaught of lies. Father, I pray that your truth would, would be shown to be the firm foundation that they can stand upon. God, I pray that they would seek to live out a godly life in Christ Jesus. And Father, I pray that you would protect them from the evil one. Father, I pray that you would continue to raise up godly older women who would pour into the lives of younger women. Father, for those who don't know you, God, I pray that they would turn to you for salvation today. And Father, help us all to remember that our Christian life is only, is only uh, we are only able to live this Christian life because of what you have done for us in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for all that you're doing. God, we pray that you would mold us and make us like clay in your palms. Father, transform us by the renewing of our minds. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.